As we're beginning, let me see. Do we, let me see if I have a copy. Do you have another copy of the survey back there? To help us evaluate this program and, and make sure that we're we're having an impact and and seeing how uh, effective this this is, um, we've got a, a quick uh, survey. When you're filling this out, what we do to, to kind of measure to see if there were some changes is we take some, some measurements before, so we have you fill this out before the workshop and then pretty much kind of the same, a lot of the same questions again afterwards. And so to do this though, we don't want to collect your name because we don't, we don't want to identify anybody or anything like that. So up at the top, you'll see just a little blank. And if you could, just put like your first initial and then, um, say the month you were born. So my name is Stan. Um, my first initial, of course, is S. I was born in March, so I'd put S maybe 03 for March. And just make sure that whatever you put on this test is the same thing that you put on the second test. It, it could really be any number or letter, just as long as it's the same thing. That way we can match up your scores at the end without having to do your name. Or we, we try not to record people's names. Pardon me? Yeah, that's fine. Just, just make sure that whatever you put on this one, you put on the post test when we fill that one out. Yes. No, you can just, you can just, you could do 06 for June, you could, you know, whatever. As long as, so if you do T06 on this one, just make sure you put T06 on the other one. And I'm going to read through them real quick just to make sure that everybody understands the questions. They're, they're pretty basic, but just in case. You know, the first one is what age group are you in? And so then you got all sorts of choices there. Uh, I don't know. Do I see any 18 to 29-year-olds in this group? Um, in the past 12 months, the second question, in the past 12 months, what was your primary source of health insurance? So this is mainly what you had. So if you've come off and on health insurance, what you feel like you've had the most. If you've been uninsured for... Most of that time, then you would put uninsured. The first uh, choice is uninsured, not covered. Second choice, B, is employer or employer union-sponsored insurance. C is public coverage, so that would include Medicare or Medicaid. And D would be your own privately purchased insurance. And then E would be some other form, and you can place that down if you, if you mark that one, what that is. Number three, in the past 12 months, how would you rate your health status? A is very good. B is good, C is average, D is bad, and E is very bad. And in the last 12 months, is number four, in the last 12 months, how many times did you visit the doctor to get care for yourself? So A would be zero times, B would be one to two times, C three to four, D five to nine, and E ten or more times. Now, now, these questions are kind of on a scale, these next ones, on, on question number five. So on a scale of one to five, and so one would be the least, so you're, you're the least comfortable with this, or five being the most or very, very comfortable. You know, ha mark how comfortable you are at filling out forms at your doctor's office. That's, no, that's A. So if you're not very comfortable filling out those forms, you'd want to mark a one or two. If you're real comfortable and think you do fine at that, you'd want to mark a four or five. Following your doctor's instructions, same thing. If you're very comfortable, up near the five. If you're not very comfortable, then closer down to the one. 5C, taking medications as directed. Five D, how comfortable are you interpreting your doctor or interrupting, I'm sorry, interrupting your doctor when they're speaking too fast? And if I'm going too fast, just please raise your hand and stop me. I'd be happy to. 5E, how comfortable are you asking for more clarification when your doctor uses medical terms that you do not understand? 
one being not at all, three being somewhat comfortable, and five being very comfortable. 5F, how comfortable are you asking questions when your doctor's explanations or instructions are unclear? So when you're not quite sure you understand the doctor, how comfortable are you stopping him saying, hey, wait, doc, can you, can you explain that again? Question number six, on a scale of one to five, with one being the least and five being the most, how much do you know about health literacy techniques and resources that you can use to improve understanding? So with that one, if you're, if you're not very familiar with any of those techniques, you'd want to put a one or two. If you, if you know a few techniques to help you understand in the doctor's office, then put a four or five. And then part B of that, how aware are you of the role that health literacy plays in empowering you to make appropriate health decisions? Just a couple more questions, then we'll be all done with this. So number seven, think back to the last time you were sick, and uh, what was the first thing you did? Or, or kind of think of this as, where was the first place you turned for information? A, you scheduled a doctor's appointment. B, you called the nurse's line. C, you just called the doctor. D, you called a friend or family member. Um, e, you did some research on the internet, so you went out online and looked up some information. F, you actually looked up that information at the library instead of on the internet. Or uh, G, you just went to the emergency room to seek care. And then if there was something else, that would be H for other, and, and you just please write that down. And then eight, what is the most common way that you get medical health and health information for yourself and your family? And just mark the most common one there. So if it's A is television, B, newspapers, C, books, D, magazines, E, internet, F, radio, G, movies, H, friends or family, I, people at work, J, doctors or other traditional health providers, K, non-traditional health providers. It, it, that would be like, um, like acupuncturists and some of those other, other non-traditional healers. Um, health organizations, like you turn to the Red Cross, the American Cancer Society, or one of those. Um, religious organizations, if you get a lot of uh, health information from your church, that would be the one that you'd want to, want to mark. And then in any other, if you, if you have any. Are there any questions on that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, just mark them where you tend to get the most, if you can, if you can do that. That's <laughs> And we get our information from everywhere, so you could probably circle them all, but we're, we're trying to make you determine which is the one that you, use, you rely on the most. And I promise that when we do this a second time, it'll be a lot shorter. There won't be as many questions. All right, I'll just collect those really quick when you're done. You done? Yeah. All right. You just want to hand them forward, I'll grab them. And as we get started, let me just, I'll, I'll introduce myself. My name is Stan Hudson. I'm from uh, the University of Missouri. I work at a Center for Health Policy there, but really why I'm here today is because we work very closely with an organization called Health Literacy Missouri, and that's who's sponsored the development and, and conduct the, able to conduct this program today because of them. And this, this program's really focused on what we call health literacy, although I, I don't like to use that term a lot. It's, it's really about patient understanding and making sure that when we're talking to our doctor, that that doctor's communicating in ways that we can actually use and act upon. I mean, they, they give us a lot of information a lot of times, but if it's information that we don't understand and we can't act upon, then really the doctor's just wasting their breath. And, and so this is a way to kind of improve it for everybody. Are there any others that are completed? Thank you. Thank you. With me today um, oh, is Gwen Rotterman. She's from Health Literacy Missouri, and I'll, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself, Gwen, if you want. Um, I'm Gwen Rotterman, and I'm with Health Literacy Missouri, but the reason I'm here today is because um, I want to tell you just a little story uh, uh, to talk about um, how things can go bad, you know, when you're at the doctor's office. 
uh, two years ago and two, two years and two months ago, um, my husband was diagnosed with fourth stage rectal cancer. And um, when we went to the doctor, uh, to the oncologist, to find out how things were, you know, what we were going to have to do in order to um, hopefully um, do something about this cancer, um, we first started out with a uh, resident in, um, in the doctor's office who took a lot of time with us and explained um, the, about the cancer and about um, what we probably would look forward to in terms of his treatments and that kind of thing. And um, he asked my husband a lot of questions about who he was and um, the kind of work that he did. Um, and uh, made my husband feel like he was wanting to try to get to know him, which was important. So then uh, he said he was going to leave and he was going to come back with the oncologist, with the doctor, and with the other uh, member of their team, which was a, a nurse. So we went out and then he came back in and he came back in with the oncologist and sat next to him and then he sat right in front of my husband and myself. And um, so um, this resident didn't say anything, but the oncologist started out talking right away. And uh, the oncologist um, started to talk really, really fast, did not look at my husband in, 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 at, at all in his eyes. He was looking off in the distance. And um, he started to you know, use uh, big terms in terms of his cancer. And uh, basically, uh, within a, a few sentences, um, he told my husband he was going to have a surgery on Thursday and they were going to resect his liver. And so about that time, I said to the doctor, um, in very, I talked real, real slow. I said, doctor, my husband doesn't understand what resect means. You need to tell him what resect means. And so then he explained what resect meant, which means you know taking out a little bit of your liver is basically what it is. Uh, but he continued to not look at him, and um, and so then my husband started to ask about uh, what treatments, you know, chemo treatments were available to him. And um, there were two kinds, you know. There's one where you do it, you know, in a drip method, and the other is to take it uh, take it uh, by using a pill. And so my husband asked him, which, ones, which one would you recommend? And he didn't really give him a straight answer. And my husband said, I want the pill. OK, all right. So uh, the doctor visit was over, really bad experience. I go out into the, um, into the parking lot. We're getting in the truck. And uh, I said, why did you say the pill? And he said, because that way I don't have to go back. If I, if I have to go there for my treatments and get the drip, I'll have to go back and be with them. And I don't want to, I want the least amount of um, exposure to this healthcare team because um, they, they make me feel terrible. And so that was the day when we decided we were gonna go and do some, you know, get a diff different doctor. But it pushed just that scenario, and that was just one of, of many, really, in terms of his um, cancer, uh, really brought home to me that People can make some really bad health decisions based on how the doctor treats them. And I'm sure you all have had um, those kinds of experiences. And, um, and, and therefore, um, the outcome, or uh, whether we get well or not, uh, or whether we can even believe that we can get well or not, depends so much on that communication between us and our doctor, and whether we trust them or not. And, I, 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 and, and whether they f make us feel like we're empowered you know, to make our, our decisions. So that's, that's my so story. Um, thank you. Well, that's, that's one story. And that's how we really like to talk about these health literacy issues. And we encourage you guys to, to share some of your own stories now as well, if you want. Um, because we are recording this, I ask you to, you know, if you're going to talk or something, raise your hand. And I'll make sure that we get a mic over to you so that you can talk into it and we, we can record it. You know, Gwen's story is, is really definitely one that, you know, is, you know, cancer is the big C. When you, when you get that, it's going to be life-changing. But, you know, health literacy can affect you at, at any time and any place and any, any, you know, anyone can be affected, you know. Um, one of the reasons we don't like that term is because health literacy, it kind of makes you think that it's just people who can't read very well that have these problems. But, you know, really anybody can experience this at, this at any time. You know, I, I recall my own story where I, I had twins and um, they came premature because my wife had high blood pressure. 
and when when it was the day that they were supposed to be born, um, we were just in for a regular routine visit, and we weren't supposed to have the kids for another four weeks. And they said, "Well, we're going to keep you around because your your blood pressure is a little high, and we want to check you out." And uh, so I'm sitting there with my wife, and we're we're talking about things. And then suddenly the team comes in and they start prepping her. And so first I'm like, "Oh, well, what's going on?" Because I'm I'm scared that you know they're prepping her for something that she's not even scheduled for because they didn't tell us anything. And they're like, "Oh, well, your wife's going to be delivering soon." And so, so we, we got used to that pretty quick because that, that was going to happen. And so I had to start to decide, you know, who am I going to call? I got to call the parents. I got to get them down here and everything. And they, they whipped us around. They put us in the delivery room, got me all dressed, got me prepped, got us in there. It was a C-section. So the delivery of my two babies took four minutes. So in four minutes, I went from just me and my wife in the hospital to me in the hospital, my wife, who was now getting released back to her maternity room, one of my children um, had a little gurgle in his breathing, so they sent him down to the NICU. They assured us it was nothing, but they wanted to put him in the NICU just to watch him for a little while. And then my, my daughter was fine, and so they sent her to the nursery. And so as I'm sitting here trying to figure out who to visit first, because I just went from one person in the hospital to three people in three different parts of the hospital, they started telling me the stuff I needed to do for my kids and things I needed to do for my wife after her C-section. And, you know, I didn't hear any of that because I wasn't in a place, yeah, I wasn't in a place to, to accept that. I, could, I was just trying to process who to visit first, and, you know, I didn't, because they had rushed us through, I didn't have any parents or any family around me to help me make those decisions and things. But the doctors, a lot of times, they don't, they don't take into consideration where we're coming from as patients. And, and we really need to make that more known and, and let them know that. Because, you know, um, one of the things that we'll, we'll often show is there's a little video that shows, you know, we're, we're often very good consumers. You know, like when we go to order food at a restaurant, you know, you always, you'll ask what the specials are, what's the soup of the day. You know, sometimes you'll ask about where the waiter's from, find out a little bit about them. But when you're sitting in that doctor chair, especially after you've been waiting for an hour and a half and you finally get in to see them and you've got that 10 minutes with them and you told them, tried to tell them everything you think you can tell them and then they go, well, do you have any questions? You know, more than likely, I'm gonna say no. <laughs> because one, I've been waiting a long time and I'm ready to get home and get to dinner or get to the kids or whatever. Or two, you know, just being put on the spot like that is really, you know, you try to think of something and you can't. And so, <clears throat> so what we're going to do today is talk about some techniques and things that you can do to, to make that a little better. So um, when that doctor, you know, at the very end says, do you have any questions? You know, instead of saying yes or no or trying to think of those questions on the spot, um, one thing you can do is you can just try to tell the doctor what he just told you to make sure you understand. And so what we, what we call this is the teach back method. And we're trying to teach doctors to do this. So hopefully if you get a good health literate doctor, instead of asking you that question, do you have any questions? They'll say, now wait a minute, just you know, before you head home, if you're going to go home and talk to your husband today and tell him you know, what I told you you needed to do, what would you say? And then what they're doing is they're trying to check themselves to make sure that they explained it right. But if the physician doesn't do that, then take it upon yourself and say, listen, doc, you know, I can't think of any questions right now, but let me just tell you what I think you just told me that I need to do, just to make sure that I've got this right. And a lot of times the doctor will then will, will stop, and you know, if he's got his hand on the door, they'll take the hand off, and they'll, they'll sit down, and they'll, they'll really listen. And then you can, you can tell them back in your own words what you think, and then they'll, there's a chance for there to be some clarification if, if you know, you're, you're missing anything, or, or they explain something very poorly. <coughs> and so there's that. Um, another uh, thing, um, another issue that is very common in health literacy happens to do with uh, taking medications. I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty young person, but every night when I go to bed, I take five pills. And, you know, just, I'm not even 40, and I'm already taking more pills than I am decades old. And, and so, you know, it can be very confusing to do, to do medication. And a lot of times, they, the doctors don't explain that very clearly. I mean, they, they tell you to take it three times a day, but they don't tell you when to take it three times a day. I mean, if I need to take three pills in a day, it's easier for me just to get up in the morning and take all three pills at one time. But a lot of doctors, they don't want you to do that. And, and so, you know, when they tell you to take those three pills, you may want to ask, you know, well, when should I take them? And, and hopefully they'll get specific. Or you can, you can throw in some specific things like, what if I take it at bedtime or at, when I eat lunch or when I eat dinner and that sort of thing. And you can get to, get to some of those issues. But um, one of the techniques that you can use is what's called a brown bag medication review. 
And the reason they call it a brown bag medication review is because basically when you're at the doctor, you can just say, listen, doc, you know, I brought all my medicines in today in this little bag. So I've got all my prescriptions. I've got everything I take over the counter. And I just wanted to sit down with you for about five minutes and just go over, just show you what I take on a daily basis, just to make sure that I'm taking these things at the right time, at the right doses, and things like that. And in doing that, that's another chance for you to check and make sure that you, you understand what the doctor has said and, and some of those things. And you, it's, it's very surprising when, when clinics have done this and they started to do this, they, they found a lot of mistakes that, that are made just because you know, we get our prescriptions filled at many different places sometimes and you're getting prescriptions from different doctors who probably aren't talking to each other that much. And so sometimes we have to take it upon ourselves to make sure that we truly understand what's going on and, and some of those things. Do you have any, any stories around medication with Marty? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, I can, I, there are all sorts of uh, medication errors that you can make. I mean, I, I remember uh, a time when I went to the doctor myself, and uh, they had given me a new prescription, and so I went into the pharmacist to get it filled. I, I knew the pharmacist very well. We, we talked often. She knew that this was back when my wife was pregnant, so she ask about how the kids were coming along, how the pregnancy was going. And so we talked for like five minutes and she got out my prescription while she was doing that. She handed it to me and, you know, I trusted her. So I just got the prescription. I didn't look at the bottle, took it home, started taking it. About a week later, my wife, after I'd taken my medicine one night, comes over, gets my prescription bottle to put it up and she looks at it and she goes, well, huh, you're not Sam Hudson. And, and I was, well, and I was taking it for insomnia, but it wasn't working that well. <laughs> and I hadn't figured this out. And then she goes, you're not Sam Hudson. And then she goes, and what medicine are you taking? And I called my doctor, and it turned out I was taking an antidepressant of someone else's for a week. But it was just because, you know, that familiarity between me and the pharmacist, the pharmacist hadn't done her normal protocol of asking me my last name and my first name and my date of birth and then checking that with what was on the medicine. Since I knew the pharmacist very well, I just assumed that she was giving me what I was supposed to have and just took it. I didn't even look at the bottle. And so, you know, it's just, it just highlights how even uh, one simple thing, and, you know, thankfully it was just, you know, I thank God that it was just an antidepressant. Gwen, Gwen swears that my mood improved, so maybe, maybe I need to be on that. But <laughs> I quickly got off that and got on the right medication. So. But that just highlights a, another, another instance of, of where it can be very hard to understand medicines and, and those sorts of things. And of course, they don't have any standardized way to tell you that. I mean, there was a study that looked at hospitals, and they found that in one hospital, the doctors had 32 different ways to say, take one pill once a day. They found 32 different ways to say that. <laughs> and some of those ways can get very complex. Like if you say, you know, take, uh, take a pill once a day, if uh, someone's Hispanic and they misinterpret once, O-N-C-E in Spanish is 11. So they could be taking that pill 11 times a day. So, so it really matters, and it, it matters that we make sure that we truly understand what's, what's going on in, in these instances. Does anybody else have any, any stories that they'd like to share about what they think is a health literacy experience they had? Yes. My name is Etta Bryant, and I had an experience with the pharmacy. It was the same medicine, but you know, sometimes they change the pharmaceutical companies that they use. And in changing the ph pharmaceutical companies that they use, they gave me, instead of giving me 100 milligrams, they gave me 200 milligrams of the same medicine that I was supposed to use. But I knew the color and the size of the medicine, and I also knew the medicine. So when I called the pharmacy, to tell them that they had gave me 100 milligrams more than I was supposed to have of, of what I was supposed to have. I did get the right medicine, mind you, but it was just that it was, uh, they had changed the color of the medicine was the same thing and the same shape. So, you know, you have to really be careful with that. So I, I did take it back to Walgreens and, and they apologized. They were so apologetic. But, I mean, I watch my medicine, you know, and my pharmacy also goes over your medicine with you before they give it to you, you know, because they change like every six months, I think, or so, that they change pharmaceutical companies. So that's what was that's one of my problems. But getting back to the, I'm a talker. But getting back to you know, uh, to the, to the story that the, uh, Gwen told. Gwen told I, I have a different experience. I have a wonderful doctor, and I was having the same problems that your husband was having. I had a anatomical uh, polyp, 
And so I had to go have a, a, a colonoscopy every six months, but I had a doctor who sit with me and held my hand and called me on the phone and talked to me and had talked about resection. But so having my, my polyp was negative. It was non-cancerous, but it kept coming back. They couldn't get rid of it because it was a flat line. And flat lines, are, you, know, you know about flat line polyps. So for two months I've been having a colonoscopy, but last year they got rid of it after every six months of taking part of it off. But because I had a good doctor who was in considering just taking part of the colon to resection it, but he worked with me through colonoscopies and, and holding my hand, calling me at home and talking to me and, and being there for me because I could hear things when they were putting me out when I was coming through, well, it's here again, you know. And then I woke up crying because I could hear stuff in when I was having my colonoscopy, but they were wonderful. I had a wonderful doctor. So, you know, you, you can have good ones as well as bad ones. Thanks. Yeah, you, and you bring up a couple of good examples, you know, that, that we can be, you know, active health consumers and, you know, not, not everybody has this choice, but if you can, you can shop around for doctors just like you can shop around for, for everything else. I, I know sometimes when you're on Medicare and Medicaid, they do limit, limit sometimes who you can see, and, or especially private insurance plans do that a lot. But, so you do have some limits, but you can't can shop around. And you also hinted at the, the standardization of pills that is definitely lacking. I mean, I know I, I take a generic on one of my pills and it changes almost every time, the shape and size. And so if you're relying on that shape and size and you, like, I can't remember some of my medications. They're such long names that I can't say them barely, let alone remember them. You know, if you're relying on that shape and size, then that can throw you off and indefinitely. And so that's something that I, I think the industry needs to consider, but definitely we need to consider as patients and, and making sure we're on top of that. Well, you know, I think um, what we're going to... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. You got it. Yeah. My name is Bessie Mohouse. And uh, a year ago to Alhag, my doctor checked my blood, and she found that I had cancer in my blood. And she sent me to a special. But she got found about drawing my blood. So all the, the special was done drawing my blood. So when I talked to my daughter, I said, you know what? I trust you. You found the cancer. It ain't moving. So why can't you just do what she done? And I don't have to go to two doctors. So she did take that and consider. And she still draws my blood, but the cancer is not moving. So I thank her. She's a good doctor. And I can sit down and talk to her and let her, I sit down and let her know what's going on and what I do. How I eat, you know, my and I tell her that I exercise and I go, you know, eat the right, try to eat the right food. I volunteer and tell her these things because I know my body better than she does. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. No, that's some good points. You know, there there are a lot of good doctors out there, and and to be honest, there the doctors who are are talking above, you know, not in ways we can understand or not. I don't think they're trying to be bad doctors. You just you know, when you're in medical school, you're hit with that medical jargon. That's the language that you talk to with your colleagues and you're talking to all day. It's, it's hard to kind of come out of that. And especially when you've got a time crunch of, okay, I've only got seven minutes to see this patient, and then I've got another 20 <laughs> patients to see after that. Even if something go wrong in the town, unless the town that I have to go to, all I have to do is call them. And I'm in there the same day or the next day. So I, you know, she's a caring person. I tell her she's my last one. Yeah, and, and you know, most of those doctors who, who are using that jargon and speaking too fast, when, when they're reminded and, and the, the patient speaks up and says, listen, doc, I didn't take any med medical school. You know, I didn't take anatomy. I, I don't understand that stuff. Then, then they'll usually slow down. And, and that's something else that you can do is you can, you can demand that, you know, they, they use common everyday language. You know, if, if they're describing, like if somebody's, uh, you know, Although I have a, a master's degree and went through a lot of college, I never took anatomy classes and nobody ever taught me about what, what physicians call the pathophysiology, you know, what's, what's actually causing all that disease and going on in your body. And so when they get off in those terms and they start telling me about what's going on in my aorta and how that's connected to everything, I can't picture that at all. And so what you can do though is you can ask for a, a, an analogy. And you can say, you know, can you put that in something that I can, I can picture? Because I just can't get that. And so, like, you know, I, I do a lot of plumbing around my own house. So I'll say, no, I, I get plumbing. You know, is there, is there like a plumbing analogy you could use or something like that? And then, then the doctor will be like, oh, well, yeah, it's like your kitchen sink. You know, when you get a clog in your kitchen sink, 
then we got to get that out so that the water will flow through. And I'm like, oh, well, I can picture that. I've had clogs in my kitchen sink. I understand what's going on there and the grease that's building up. And now I kind of can picture how that, that would be plaque building up in my arteries and, and things like that. And so, so you can always demand to, you know, try to have that doctor find an analogy that, that works or explain that in much more common everyday language. And, and usually physicians don't have a problem with that. I mean, a lot of times we feel like, you know, I, I don't want to interrupt the physician. You know, he's really busy. He's a, a, he's a very skilled and, you know, educated professional, gone to school for so many years and everything. And it, it can be a little hard to interrupt him. But usually when, when you do interrupt that doctor and you tell them that you're not getting it, they, they usually appreciate that because then they're not spending a lot of time explaining a bunch of stuff to you that, that isn't getting anywhere and helping you at all. And so it really helps them kind of kind of focus on that, and uh, and that's that's another thing you can do. You know, um, the way that we teach medicine and the way that medical information is presented is usually you have the symptoms, then you have what's going on in the body, and then down at the very end they talk about what you need to do about it. And really, from a patient perspective, at least when I go to the doctor, what I need to know is that at the very bottom, I want to know what I need to do to address this issue. I mean, what's going on is kind of important, but if you focus on what I need to do, then when you tell me what's going on, you're going to tell me what I need to do again. And so it makes a lot of sense. So sometimes when I go to the doctor, if they start to get off in that, oh, okay, well, here's what's going on with your, with your diabetes and your blood sugar and everything, I'll, you just stop and say, no, listen, doc, I, I'm not really getting that. What, what do I need to do to really address this issue? And you can kind of refocus them that way. And the doctors really appreciate that because then they, they know what's important to you and they can, they can really address that and make sure you understand. And then, um, let's see, did we, oh, is your hand up or you just, <laughs> okay. Um, I think there's that. Um, we talked about the teach back. You know, once you've, once you've got that in that plain language and you think you understand, then you can do that teach back again at the end and say, listen, doc, let me make sure that I really understand what you do. And especially anytime you hear that, do you have any questions? I just use that as a cue to just do the teach back right there and just say, no, I don't have any questions, but let me make sure I understood you and just recount that. So I think unless, unless anybody else would want to share a story, what we'll do now is we'll move into the second part and we'll actually have a, a, a little demonstration of a session. We have a, a doctor here. What, what should we call you, doctor? Dr. Dave or Dr. Doyle. Okay, we'll, we'll go with Dr. Dave. I like Dr. Dave. So we have Dr. Dave here. He's going to be the provider. Who would, um, in your packets, let's see, the the patient information, is it in there already? Okay. In your folders, you should see one piece of paper. It's this one right here on the top. It says uh, health literacy patient role. Looks like this. There you go. I'll give it back to you. I'm sorry. It's, yeah, it's that piece right there. If you want to just look over that real quick, this is going to be the case that we're going through. So this will be the patient, the, the patient who's being seen today. The doctor has some different background information, but this is the patient roles. Who wants to be our volunteer patient today? I'll be a volunteer. All righty. I don't mind. And what's your name again? Pat Major. Pat. All right. So Pat's going to be our volunteer. Let me let me set the stage here. We'll we'll pretend this is the doctor's office, and so. We've got the exam table here and a, a chair for the doctor to come sit in. Pat, if you want to come up and, and take your seat as a uh, patient. Do you have any questions about the case? Okay, well, go ahead and take your time and read it. Let's give everybody a few minutes to, to read the case, and then I'll answer any questions. This fits me perfectly because I had problems with blood pressure. All right, excellent. <laughs> Now, now, the one thing I will say before we get started is that this is just a simulated acting session. So, although there may be some medical advice that is given, do not act upon it. It is not, it's, it's not actual medical advice. So, so, we want to, you know, if you come up with any good questions for your doctor, write them down and then we'll go ask your doctor, not, <laughs> not okay, Dr. I've Dave. Got, I've got a new doctor, so I've got to go ask. We really want to keep this simulation kind of going why it's, why it's going to let the, the actors kind of stay in character. So if you do have any comments or questions, I know a lot of times when I watch this and I, I, I want to 
say, oh, you know, what I would do as a patient is do that. Just kind of save those till the end and we'll, uh, we'll address them and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of have a final discussion and we can talk about those. If, if there is something that's really pressing and you really just have to say it, then go ahead and raise your hand. And what we'll do is we'll just do a quick, we'll call a timeout. And so the, the physician actor will put his head down and he won't be able to answer any questions or anything because he's going to stay in character, but I'll be able to address anything. And then we'll, once we're done with that, we can call a time in and, and keep on going. But, but if you can, please try to hold your questions and comments until after we're done with the session. It, it'll only be about 10 or 15 minutes, so it shouldn't be too long. Hello. Hi, Ms. Pat. I'm Dr. Dave. How are you today? I'm fine. How are you, sir? Pretty good. Let's see. Uh, I hear that you, I see that you're here for your follow-up on your diabetes visit, and um, we've also been managing your hypertension and your migraines. So um, we'll take a look at that. And uh, you're on looks like three different medications here: two for your diabetes and one for your hypertension. Right. Um, when the nurse was in earlier, it looks like we've got uh, we're doing pretty good with your your diabetes. Your hemoglobin A1C is about 7.4, which is pretty good, but we're not doing so good with your blood pressure, so we're going to take a look at that. So, uh, Excuse me, sir. What can I do about the blood pressure? What can I do to control it a lot more than what by just taking just the medication? Well, um, I think there's a couple things we can do, but it looks like the medication we're giving you, it's gotten better than it was a year ago, but right now it's still 154, um, 154 over 86, which is a bit high. So one thing we might be able to do is increase and take that blood pressure medicine twice. Uh, twice a day, okay. uh, or we might have to try a different medicine. Which would you, pre which would you pre decide would be best for me? Well, it's, it's, uh, blood pressure is not exact science, so we have to kind of work with it and see how your body responds. What I think, because you're taking the two other medications for your diabetes, the, um, let's see, you're taking a sulfonylurea and a metformin, so I think we'll, is that right, those, those two, and then the, yes. uh, the Cinepril for your blood pressure? Yes. Okay, so I think what we might do is just see if we can take the lisinopril uh, twice a day. Um, I think we increased it in the past, yeah. We went up from 10 milligrams to 20 milligrams in the past, so I think maybe we'll go with uh, trying it in the morning and the evening, okay. and we'll keep going on the other two medications for your blood pressure. Okay, but what would you suggest I do better for the blood pressure other than just the two medications? Um, well, what other things are you doing? I mean, we've talked a little bit in the past about your diet and your exercise. Are you doing any Yes, exercise? I am. I'm doing exercise. I, I'm, I do on my bicycle at least 5 or 10 or 15 minutes a day, every day. Well, you could do some more of that. Okay. Um, but uh, I think that from a standpoint of medically manage, I'm, I, I am a bit concerned with your blood pressure, especially when it starts to combine with the diabetes, mm -hmm. that it might cause some more complications. So we're going to have to... Well, what else could I do for the diabetes other than just take the medication? The diabetes as well, we can take a look at the, uh, how you're doing with your diet. What, what kind of things? We talked about improving your diet a little bit. I think the exercise is a big part of that. Well, would you recommend that I would talk to maybe a nutritionist about the diet so I could go on to like certain things to do with your nutrition as well as your di for your diabetes, like maybe get certain like certain cookbooks? that you would have that you could do for diabetes? No, that would be great if you talk to the dietitian. Um, one of the things we try to do is help people decrease the amount of fat in their diet and make sure that they're eating more frequently throughout the day. So is that something that you're doing currently? Yes. You're having snacks? Anywhere I eat from anywhere to four to five to six small meals a day and oh, maybe a fantastic. snack in the morning and a snack in the afternoon. Okay. Well, that might be why we're seeing such uh, pretty good results here with your, with your blood sugar and your glucose. What uh, is your normal rate for your blue, glucose and your blood sugar? Well, right now, the, there's two different numbers. The, the blood sugar, we like to see under 120. And then there's another number called your hemoglobin A1C that we'd like to see at about 7. Yours is 7.4, which means over a longer period, it's pretty good control. So the blood sugar is doing okay, but the, um, the other things that you can do that will really affect your blood pressure and your diabetes is maybe taking a look at increasing your exercise a bit. Okay. Okay? Okay. So um, did you have any other questions about um, what we're doing with your meds or any other things? That uh, I'd like to make sure that you want to increase my blood pressure medicine to two, ti two times a day from tw 20 to 40 milligrams and to increase my exercise. Do I have a correct doctor? 
Yes, actually you do. So what, how do you take your medicines now? I take one medicine in the morning and one medicine in the afternoon, and maybe the, there, there's two, like two diabetes, and I'll take a couple of diabetes in the afternoon, like maybe like between four and seven in the afternoon. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to continue with the diabetes medicines being the same. We'll do one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And we'll do, instead of just one blood pressure pill in the morning, we're going to go to one in the, in the evening as well. So you'll be doing all three pills in the morning and all three pills at night. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions about your exercise? Just increase it more so I can, that my hemoglobin comes down and my weight comes down so it controls the blood pressure a whole lot better. Right. The other thing that we're a little bit concerned about is that uh, last year you had a test called microalbumin and it was a bit high, so I'm going to want to do that test again. What is a microalbumin? <laughs> That's a good question. There's, when it gets to diabetes, there's all sorts of fancy names and different tests, but um, microalbumin actually is just a test to see how your kidneys are working and that when you start to have difficulty with both your diabetes and your blood pressure, sometimes it puts a lot of pressure on your kidneys. Okay. So last year it showed that your kidneys were having some problems. Um, I'm going to redo that test again. We want to probably watch that more regularly. How often we'll is back. that done? Um, we may do that every six months to see if, just to make sure your kidneys aren't getting any, uh, any damage. Okay. Um, the uh, blood pressure medicine, I'm going to try putting you on the blood pressure medicine, and we'll have you come back uh, maybe about two months, and we'll take a look at your blood pressure again. Okay. Okay? Okay. Is that it? That's it. Did you have any other questions for me? Not that I can think of right now, and if I do, I will call you, doctor. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds good. And you can, you can either stay seated here, or you can return to your seat, whichever you would prefer. You can okay. take that with you. So what did you guys think about that? Um, what what'd she do well? What would you have done? Go ahead. I think she carried this. She carried the dog. He came and told her a little bit. She knew what she wanted. And you talked a little bit fast. Pat knew what she wanted. You talked a little bit fast. Was, it the, was this supposed to be a first visit? No, follow-up visit. This was okay. a follow-up. Okay. Uh, she mentioned exercise first. She mentioned the A1C first because when you told her it was 7.4, that was all right. She, she recognized that that was not real good. Um, <laughs> and when you talked about the term about checking the kidneys, she asked you what she was supposed to ask you, but you weren't able to help her because that word would help me too. And uh, that's it, but she carried, she carried this very good for a patient. Now, and I, I would agree, you were, you were a very good patient and you brought up a lot of things. That and the only other thing that I do when I'm with my doctor if it's the first visit, I asked him his age. <laughs> because I don't want them too young. Because they don't want to be bothered with old people. And sometimes if they admit, they'll ask, this is the question that's been asked of me. How old are we? So that means anything is supposed to happen to me because I'm old, so I got another doctor. But I enjoyed that. That's some good insight. I think um, Ms. Pat, as a patient, did a fantastic job, yeah. um, and I think she was much more informed than many yeah. people in terms of understanding. She uh, also s may I say something? And Willisteen, I want to thank you so much because I was with her and her in a we had a diabetes thing. And see, I took that over a year ago down at the library. So, and I know, and they're they're friends of mine from here. And and I know they've got diabetes, so we've kind of back and forth, you know, when we were in the diabetes. So that may be the reason why I came back with so many questions. I think it was that aspect of the specific information, but there's the other aspect of saying that you were also very good at jumping in and asking questions. Um, many people, including Stan or myself, sometimes haven't been. And I think it was a great example that, yes, you should have that confidence. This is your visit. Um, well, you just know, to respond today, to I don't want to interrupt you, mm -hmm. but I was I was taking some tetracycline many many years ago from 
from my doctor, and he had prescribed like 700, uh, 500 milligrams. And when they transferred it over from Walgreens up to Rangers, they transferred 750. Had I not had a pharmacy friend call me to find out, I would have ended up taking 750 and really gotten sick. So, you know, I mean, you're going to have to watch it when you transfer it over because Scott called and said, was it 750? I said, no, it's supposed to be 500. You better ch double check with the doctor. You know, so, I mean, that's just one of my stories. I had, okay, go ahead. I had uh, the problem once with my diabetes medicine. The doctor somehow now wrote 1,000 milligrams of a particular medicine for my diabetes. And I told, I had, when the pharmacist filled it and I got it home, I called the pharmacist and I said, this is too strong for me. I said, because I'm already on three or four other kind of diabetes medicines, they're 500 milligrams. I said, and to put me on a thousand milligrams, I said, I won't be able to walk, talk or nothing. I said, so you got to do something different. So between that and they cut it back, they cut it down 500 milligrams because it was definitely too, too much, a whole thousand milligrams. I'm already taking 500 of one thing and 500 of another, and that they come together on you. Then with blood pressure medicine, five or six hundred milligrams of this and 500, you, you won't really know yourself. That's, that's it. I think that's an excellent example of how informed you are and aware you are of how many milligrams, how many times that many people aren't and it kind of goes back again i'm acting as a doctor here but it, the doctor has a lot more information i couldn't yeah. explain what those medicines do what are some other problems but um i think if, if we keep looking at how do we make the interaction between the patient and the doctor more pro productive for you that you get more out of it um just so you know i i stand and ask me start off talking very quickly and try to use terms that the doctor would use and then if there's questions start to slow down and explain things. So hope I'm glad that you observed that I, I did that. Well, me, uh, I'm a little critical. First, the doctor don't say how old. I don't ask the doctor how old he is. He asks me to say how young he is. Maybe he's trying to make me feel good. But my problem was your interview with the doctor. You, you didn't give the doctor time to answer everything you asked. You knew you were you were acting more of the like the doctor than he was. You know, I mean, you know, you really went a little ahead of the doctor, and you didn't give him a chance to answer. I would have thought you were the doctor, and he was the patient. You know, you got to listen to what he say before you suggest something else. You know, I thought you did a good job. Your job wasn't bad, but give the doctor time to answer the question that you asked him, and to tell you what you need to do because he is the doctor, not you. I'm critical, and I know it. My doctor and materials that I find say that the A1C should not be more than seven. Now, I heard you say that 7.4 was all right. Now, is that true? Does this differ with different doctors? Uh, how does how does that go? That's an excellent question for your doctor, and that the, you're, you're correct. The 7.0 is the guideline and recommended level. In this thing, where in this scenario where I was trying to act it out, I was trying to say that one's mo doing much better. It, maybe what we said was this patient didn't wasn't doing so good with their diabetes control in the past. Compared to their blood pressure, their diabetes was actually not bad. Their blood pressure is really too high, but. The actual real numbers, as Stan said, if you go to your doctor, you are correct. Seven is the number that you're striving for. I have a question to ask you. I only take six pills a day. But I would like to know what time to take them in the morning or evening. Or can you take my doctor? She never told me. She just said, take, one, uh, take your medicine once a day. Then my urine, I will constantly go sometimes during the night. Well, she said that's normal. She says nothing wrong with my um, bladder, my urine, anything like that. But what I'm trying to find out, when should I take that medicine? Should I take it in the morning? Uh, when, she's never said, she said, take your medicine 
once a day, I take a breath pressure pill, I take a, a, a small pill, cut it in half for my heart. Then I take another pill, it's Plavix, that is for my blood to circulate. And since I've fallen, it affected me for my blood not circulating. I'm getting around to getting strong, stronger, you understand? So I, yeah, can you answer my question? Tell me how many times a day? A um, those are excellent questions, and those are the exact same. Those are the absolutely the best questions to talk to your doctor. One suggestion I would have, because I can't give you specific recommendations on your medicine, but what we can do in this context is say that there's a specific technique that we would encourage people to ha ask their doctors about. My dad, 83, fell down in December, broke his hip. They discovered a heart problem. He also has severe arthritis, all sorts of different things. He's on five new medicines, and I was just doing this with him. You can ask your doctor to actually make a card for you. There's a medicine, a medication or a medicine card and what the doctor can do is they actually take one of, the one of the pills on there, they put the name of it, and then they put how frequently or when you're supposed to take it during the day. So instead of just telling you, take this one and that one and this one, you have seven and you can't remember them, ask the doctor, can you put those on a medicine card for me so I can look at something and say, oh, this blue pill is for my blood pressure and I take it in the morning and lunchtime and at nighttime. It's all on one card. And I have all seven pills in one spot on a medicine card that might be a, a technique that you can ask for, for the doctor to explain better and that you walk out of the office not just with a list of names, but actual picture. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. The, other, the other thing I would recommend is whenever the doctor talks in generalities like that, you know, just take one pill once a day, get them to be specific. And not just, you know, even, even in the morning and the evening may not be specific enough. Because, you know, one time I was talking to my doctor and I found out that he really wanted me to take the pills six hours apart. And it didn't matter when I took them as long as it was six hours apart. But I never got that until I finally started asking him about specifically. Because I was like, well, is it okay if I take one now and then one when I get home from work and one when I go to bed? And he's like, well, how long do you work during the day? And I'm like, well, I'm usually there eight to ten hours. And he's like, no, that won't work. You have to take this six hours apart. And so you, you, sometimes you have to ask those questions to get more specific when, when they're not being as specific. Because they, they just, a lot of times you just assume as a provider that, you know, when I say take one pill once a day, most people should understand that. And, or, you know, another common one is to take, take those pills on, uh, on a full stomach. I, I've seen that, and, and some people don't understand that, that means you need to eat before you take the pill. That's, that's not really explained what a, what a full stomach constitutes. And some people think you need to eat a big meal before you take the pill, and that it's not just you could have a snack and then take the pill and that sort of thing. So if you can, try to get to those specifics when they're not offered. And anytime you, know, you're, you're, you have that kind of question that just pops in your head, just stop that doctor immediately and, and get them to explain that to you. Because otherwise, you know, the, and the doctors will, when we talk to doctors about this, they'll admit, you know, they don't want to waste their breath. And, you know, they've only got 10 minutes. They want to talk about the stuff that's going to mean the most to you and, and, and really help you to, to address the issue that's at hand. Sometimes it's on your printout from the pharmacy. You know, it tells you when to take it, morning or night, or with full stomach, or with food, or without food, if you read the printout, you know. Yeah, and, and actually those, those standards are changing. And so there, there is a, a set of recommendations that's coming down from the pharmaceutical industry so they will get more specific on their labeling. And, and so instead of just taking three times a day, in, in the future, as long as they're meeting those standards, it should say take three times a day, one at you know, lunch, dinner, th those sorts of things. So hopefully that will, that will improve as the system improves. But until it does, we're going to have to take responsibility for ourselves to make sure that we really know and understand what the doctor means when they say take that pill twice a day. I think the other thing is to feel, feel confident that when you go to the pharmacy and you see there's a line of 10 people behind you and the pharmacy says, do you have any questions about this? I often look back and say, no. <laughs> so if you have a question, it's fine to stand there as long as it takes for you to understand how do I take this right and how does it, you know, so don't, don't get rushed so, by other people waiting. So they did, it's just the same medication but it's just different shape and color. They write that down when they change the color on your medication. And they always give you how much, you know, you should, and they ask you, of course, do you know you're taking the medicine? You need to call your doctor, you don't need these two medications. 
Is that's what I do. I said the farmer said I don't need you know folks to be because they interact. We don't interact with one another. And that, that's why it, it's good to sometimes ask for that, that brown bag medicine review. I, I know that I've, I've seen it in one of the examples was a, a, an older woman and she was going through the medications and the, the doctor was looking and he's like, okay, so you've got this pill for your thyroid, but then you've also got this pill for your thyroid. Do you take two thyroid pills? And uh, the lady looks at him and she goes, oh, no, I don't. I probably got those filled by mistake and have been, you know, just taking them. And, and so you, you can come up with some of those. And, and in that case, it was because the thyroid pill was a different generic and a different color. And so she didn't realize she was taking the same pill until the doctor pointed it out to her. Yes, we know. You know, I write the name of my ass and take the medication in once a year. I, go, I have to go every three months anyway because I have to keep a check on my bloods. So that's an excellent technique. Are there any other questions you have that if you could have asked your doctor, or I don't know how to ask my doctor, or I'm not comfortable asking my doctor, and we can say, here's how you might ask. Or is there anything you would have done differently up here if you were sitting in the patient seat instead of Miss Pat? Most that I let him know is anything different. I have to, you know, how I feel from the last time I saw her. You know, how I feel and I don't really let her know. I volunteer and tell her, you know, what's going on. This pain hurt here. She said that I don't know. 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 I don't Come back and tell the primary what the heart doctor said. So I don't have no problem with none of that. If one tells me one thing, I'll tell the other one what the one said, and he put me on this kind of pill. Do you think I should be on this kind of pill? And you know, vice versa. I, you know, from one to the other. I, I speak to whatever one says, the other one hears it. You know, so I don't have no problem talking to him. Yeah, and, that, and that's a very important point. That's, that's one of the reasons why we, we have to be clear about our health because a lot of times we're the ones who are talking for the doctors to the other doctors yeah. instead of them talking to themselves. And if we give misinformation, it can affect our health. That's it. They don't talk to each other. You have to be the middle man. And then when you, another thing, when, when you go, the doc, if your doctor's office don't take blood, then he gives you that sheet and sends you to the blood place. No. And if you don't ask the doctor what's blood for, they won't tell you. They just write down there, write down there, and hand it to you. And the blood person might be taking blood for... <laughs> for anything, for anything, so you, you do better. That question, question them. When they give you that sheet of paper, you be sure to ask them, what are they taking the blood for? You know, so that way you know, and you're not walking around stupid, you know, with something that you shouldn't have. So it's better, it's better to talk. Definitely. Did you? Yes, I had a situation. Well, I've been a very sick person, you know. I had surgery, major surgery last year, and I had a hernia repair. And uh, all my intestinals, everything was outside of my wall, and I was just like almost a goner, you know. But in the past, I had cancer also, breast cancer. And uh, this doctor I was seeing, which was a primary doctor I was seeing, and for some reason, I don't think he knows himself. I was taking 17 pills a day. 17 pills a day. And then after that, um, after I had the surgery and everything and I went back to see another doctor, I didn't want to see him anymore because he was arrogant. And you asked him questions, it was like snap you up. Well, why are you in this field then? You know, I, I need the help, you know, and I'm studying taking all different medications, and I want to know 
what am I taking it for? Each time I go back, I get a different prescription. I'm not taking any more. 17 was enough. And then I had uh, chemotherapy. He took me off of some medication that he shouldn't have never took me off of. And by me taking, I take five, uh, 50,000 milligrams of uh, vitamin D. And he took me off of that. He shouldn't have. He taken me off a uh, cancer pill I shouldn't have been. So he took me off of like four pills that I was taking that he took me off of. Shouldn't have been. So I, by next I got a different doctor. But when I told this doctor that all what was going on, and she was saying, well, why would he do that? So she had to question, went to her superior and asked her, they don't know. And right today, he don't have a job at BJC anymore because he did something very stupid, you know. And you, I would ask him about different things. It was just like here and here. He didn't care. And when I told him that all the problems that I've had, it was like, well, uh, what, what, I mean, why did they do this here? Why did they do that? It was for a reason. And anytime you have cancer, that is urgent, that is serious. It's very serious. Then he wanted me to go and get, um, uh, go back to another doctor that I shouldn't have been seeing that doctor because that wasn't what I was going to him for. You know, so he was just all messed up in the head, you know, because he was dealing with my life. So, you know, and after that, I listened to what the doctors tell me, and right today, I'm still not taking 17 pills a day now. I'm taking 12 now. And I have to take these pills every day. Every day. So when I go back next week, I go to the doctor tomorrow, they tell me about something else. You know, so the doctors that I have, they're very good. Very good, because they saved my life. Because I was almost gone. But I appreciate some doctors are very good, and I, some of them are crap. <laughs> I think that's that's the important point. It's it's our all of our right to be able to ask questions and understand what's going on with my body and what's the treatment supposed to do. Um, how many people know when you go to the pharmacy to pick it up? Do you know the difference between the pharmacist and the technician who's yeah, actually yeah. behind the counter? Yeah. Yeah. So there's always a pharmacist there. That's the person with the doctor in pharmacy. Right. Those are excellent people mm -hmm. in terms of medication and education right their ability to explain you can always when you're at the pharmacy if the technician behind there is not helping you or you want to step out of line you can always ask can i talk to the pharmacist mm -hmm. and step off to the side and say right. what are these about and mm -hmm. so that's that's a resource for you as well when you have questions about your medicine you probably spend more time with them right. at the drugstore or the walgreens or schnooks or whatever you're going then sometimes you have in the doctor's office yeah, oh, I have one question. It's just like the cards you were saying about put each pill down and what it's for. The nutrition did that. And it, would, it made it so much better for me because I was taking so much medication. Some of it just had me like I was just in a daze all the time. Didn't know, you know, I was taking it, but I really didn't know I was all taking it for. So when I went to the uh, nutritionist and they sat down there and it took, took all my medicine there, and they put it on a card and told me just what it was for, what time to take it. And then I take like three pills or so at night before I go to bed. So that worked out real fine for me because I was like a zombie at one time, you know, because I'm on so much medication and I'm not knowing what time to take this here. I'm just taking it. And then we had it start messing with my stomach and I have gastritis problems too. So therefore, everything was just messed up. You know, but after I got to, to the point that where I understood about taking the medicine, it was much, much better. And, and I think Dr. Dave makes a really good point that, you know, these techniques are not just for your doctor. They're with any health professional. So if, you know, maybe you do get that bad doctor that time that won't answer your questions and gives you a little grief when you ask them, 
then you know just don't ask him go to the nurse or you know if it is a medication question the the pharmacy you can do that you can do a brown bag review with the pharmacist just as easy as you can with the doctor and the pharmacist will will be able to identify some of those errors and things as well and and, and make sure that you're taking those properly one thing i know my dad is struggling with is that uh with all the different doctors he's seeing right now and forgetting stuff his memory's not good um, trying to remember what physical therapy and what appointment and why I'm doing things and what medicine to take every day. It's like his whole life has become, what's the next pill and what's the next thing I'm supposed to do for the doctor? And he's forgotten that those are the things I'm supposed to be doing to enjoy my life. <laughs> and I think that, that's the part of, of trying to talk to your doctor too. I'm doing this to, taking care of my head so health shouldn't take over my whole life. So how do I understand what I need to do, but I also want to do it to feel better. Listed, and I carry them with me at all times. And sometimes you go to your doctor and he'll say, what are you taking? He, he has that information, but he has to go in his file. I have it listed on a piece of paper, and I have the strength, the dose, how often, and what those pills are for. Then I have what they look like printed on the side. And then I have my doctor's name and anything about information that anybody can call and find out what I'm taking. That's what is help, that helps you quite a bit. All I have to look at is look at this, and if that's not the, the strength or the pill that they gave me, mm -mm, I don't care what it looks like, that's wrong. That's great. So that's what's something that you need to do for yourself. A little medication cheat sheet, I like it. <laughs> and sometimes, again, it, it, your doctor's asking, the doctors aren't always, I work with medical students, but the doctors aren't always skilled at, at explaining. When I say, what medicines are you taking? They may be trying to make sure that you understand or what you can tell them, but it doesn't come out that way. And they may think, you may think like, well, don't you have that information? So having it written down is really helpful. Oftentimes they do, because oftentimes your medicines are coming from different doctors and you're getting them filled at the same pharmacy. You know, the doctor know what to order for what you need, but when you go to the pharmacist, he can tell you more about it, even the nurses can, than the doctor. They know what you need, but they're not as familiar with the medicine that you take as the pharmacist or the nurses, you know. Well, I take so many to my <laughs> A nice list, once a day, twice a day, in the name of it in my purse at all times. I had an experience. I think she was next. I'm sorry. <laughs> You've been waiting for about five minutes to say something. Go ahead. Um, I would like to piggyback on what the lady at the end said about this card with the name of the medication, what it's for, how many times a day, and blah, blah, blah. I have such a card, and it also has a history of surgeries and all that kind of stuff. And many times when you go to take a certain kind of test or to a new doctor, and they ask you to list all this on your the application or the paper you fill out, you give them this card, and they'll just go and Xerox it for you and attach it, and they'll have all that history there. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, my medical doctor has all my records. And when I go to another doctor, you know, everything is specialized now. You go to the foot doctor, you go to um, a diabetes doctor, you go to, you know, whatever. But every time I go to a doctor that is not my medical doctor, I ask them to send a communique to my medical doctor. And he puts it in his record. And when I go back to my medical doctor, which is four times a year, about three times uh, on a regular checkup and one for an uh, annual physical, I ask him, did you get the communique from Dr. 
Smith or Dr. Angelo or whatever. He said, oh, yes, I got it. And if you ask them, they will send whatever happened to your medical doctor whom you choose. And that one person will have all your records. Excellent idea. I always find out, like, if you get a new prescription and uh, you always have uh, a printout what the med medicine is for, the side effects. So I always read what the side effects are. Because sometimes when I read what the side effects are, I really don't want to take the medicine. They say sometimes it's going to make you dizzy, you'll have rapid heartbeat. I said, well, my God, this is what I have here. <laughs> and, and, you know, they don't, they don't explain that very well because, you know, from a, from a health perspective, those are really written more for attorneys, you know, just to make sure that they cover every possible thing that, you know, even like one, one millionth of a chance that you might get dizzy because of this, they're going to list it so that they're not legally obligated. And so that can be very confusing because, you know, the average person probably will not experience any of those side effects, but they've still got to have that long laundry list. And it can be quite scary. I still always read it. You know, oh, yeah. I still read it. It's really helpful. Well, sometimes I see a new medicine on, comes on a TV commercial. I'm like, wow, that's great. And then the list of all the side effects is longer than the benefit. <laughs> Well, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of our time, and so to, to respect some of your time, we'll, we'll probably stop the commenting right now, and we'll, we'll kind of wrap up, but I'll be sticking around afterwards, so if you want to talk some more about this, I'd be happy to talk, and I'm, I don't know if Dr. Dave has some time, but he may be able to stick around, but we'll be sticking around. Um, before we leave, I wanted to go over a few of the th other things that we put in your folder here. Um, some of them are just some resources you may find useful, you may not. Um, one is a, a kind of a tip sheet for a better doctor visit, so some things that you can do before, during the visit, and after to kind of prepare, you know, things like writing down some questions ahead of time so that when that doctor does ask do you have any questions, you can pull out your list and go, well, let me see, doctor, here's what I've got, to, got going on, and things like that. Um, we also have a, a medication checklist, so if you are concerned and you're, you're taking 12 pills a day or 15 or 17, you know, you might want to go through this checklist and just make sure that you've told your doctor about all of these things or maybe your pharmacist if, if you have more time with your pharmacist. Um, there's another sort of tip sheet that just says getting to good health and it just gives some just really basic tips on, on things that you can do, what you can have doctors and providers do, what you can get your community and your organization here to do and your friends to do and things like that to just take control when you're in that doctor's office and kind of take those reins back so that you can make sure you understand. The last thing that is in here. Oh, I'm sorry, there are two more things. Um, one, we, we like to include this just because uh, getting around the hospital can be difficult. So there's, there's a kind of a cheat sheet that gives some of those big, long words and then tells you what they are. I know just in our hospital alone, you know, most hospitals when they're built, they're not built as one single building. There's like a wing here and then they build a wing here and so they don't give a lot of thought. And, you know, at our hospital, we constantly tell patients to go to x-ray but the sign above the door says radiological services. And so you have patients standing right under the sign going, where's x-ray? And you have doctors looking at them like they're crazy going, well, it's right behind you. But nobody really realizes that the health professionals were telling you to go to x-ray, but we don't even list it on the door as that. And, and I've known patients who, when they can't find the x-ray room, they just walk out of the hospital rather than ask questions or, or be embarrassed about not being able to find it. So, so that's just some terms to help you get around. And then, and then finally, we've got a small list of just some resources. And these are, these are some things such as the Ask Me Three, which is three good questions that you could ask in any visit that will, that will help you attain understanding and things like that. So if you've got a computer at home or you can get online at the library or here at the church or something, you can, you can look at some of these resources. So that's, that's really about it for the workshop. Unless you have any other questions, we'll finish up with our last little uh, survey here. Like I said, it's a lot shorter, so it shouldn't take us as long. Remember to put what, whatever initials and numbers you put on the first one. Be sure to put on the second one as well so that we can match it up.
And you can go ahead and start to fill it out, but I'm going to read through it anyway, just in case. Um, so these are pretty much the same questions we had right at the end. So on a scale of one to five, with one being the least and five being the most, how comfortable are you with A, filling out forms at your doctor's office? And just circle whichever one, one through five. Uh, B, following your doctor's instructions. C, how comfortable are you taking medications as directed? One for not at all comfortable, three for somewhat comfortable, four if you're really comfortable taking your medications, don't have any problems. D, how comfortable are you interrupting your doctor when he or she is speaking fast? And, and these answers may have changed from earlier, so, so feel free. Um, e, asking for more clarification when your doctor uses medical terms that you do not understand. One for not at all comfortable, five for very comfortable. F, asking questions when your doctor's explanations or instructions are unclear. Then number two, on a scale of one to five, with one being the least and five being the most, how knowledgeable are you now about health literacy techniques and resources that can improve your understanding? And B, how knowledgeable are you about the role that health literacy plays in empowering you to make appropriate health decisions? So one would be not very knowledgeable, two would be pretty knowledgeable, and five would be very knowledgeable. And then finally, that last kind of open-ended question with a, with a bunch of lines there, if, what, what did you learn? Was there anything today that you learned that, would really, that really helps you as you go forward and meet with your doctor? So what specific actions you know, that you learned today will really help you out in the future? If there are any, there may not be any. If so, if there aren't, feel free to leave that blank. But if there are, please write them down because we want to we wanna know what, what was really working so that we can focus on that in the future. Sure. Um, as, as we get older, it hasn't happened to me, but I've seen it happen. Why? Okay, say this is an elderly person going to the doctor and someone is accompanying them. Why do doctors talk to this person accompanying them they, rather than the patient? You know, what I mean is they might ask this person, because I used to go with my mother, and they'd ask me, does she go to the bathroom through the night much? Uh, does she eat well? Does she? And she's right there. And my mom lived alone. I didn't live with her. But why? And I've seen them do it to other people. They ignore the patient and ask whoever is accompanying them. Why do they do seniors that way? You know, I, I think some of that stems from the fact that you know, I think they're just making an assumption there. They, they should be asking, you know, the patient. Why, why this person is accompanying them. But I think what they're probably doing is they're just assuming that because you're with your mom, you're the caregiver, and so they start asking you questions. But that, that is definitely something that, that should be addressed, and, and you, you should speak up. And Excuse me, but don't you think that maybe the patient might be able to interrupt the doctor and say, hey, I'm here, can't you ask, ask me? Can't you ask, ask me the questions? Well, the, the patient can, but some, sometimes the patients, I mean, I know especially, you know, like my, my mom might not be comfortable doing that with the doctor. And so, it, it, but she'd be comfortable with me stepping up and saying, listen, I'm not the caregiver here. You need to, you need to talk to her. You know, I'm just here because I'm, I'm helping her out. That's what I just Yeah. But yeah, you got, and you got to make that clear. And, and hopefully the doctor, next time you see him, will remember that you're the caregiver and not make that assumption. But... But I'm pretty sure what's going on is they're just, they assume that because there's more than one person there, you must be the caregiver, and that's why you're there. Because a lot of people will just come to the doctor by themselves. But, but that's the problem. You know, health professionals make a lot of these assumptions, and that's why they fail to communicate correctly and adequately and make sure that you understand. Because that's, that's a lot of times what they do when they give you the, all that in jargon and really fast. They're assuming you get it. And when they ask, do you have any questions, and you say no, they assume that you don't have any questions and that, that, that's it, so you got it. And so that, that's kind of why when they ask that last, do you have any questions, that's kind of your last check to say, no, wait a minute, doc, I, and, and give them a sign that, no, I really didn't get what you were saying at all. Okay. 
I'll take those when you're done. And when you're done, thank you. I really appreciate you guys being here today and participating. And yeah, you keep the folder and everything. All I need back is your, your little form, your survey. Thank you.